In this demonstration, I'm going to talk about the knee and its surrounding structures of great clinical importance because of the frequency of injuries to the knee. And the common expression is internal derangements of the knee. And it's only by appreciating the anatomy of the knee that you can really work out what's happening to your patient. So first of all, let's see what the bony structures are in and around the vicinity of the knee. So let's have a look at the immediate bony structures. The lower end of the femur with its medial and lateral condyles. The upper end of the tibia with its medial and lateral condyles. The tibial tuberosity for insertion of the ligamentum patelli, and in front, uh, the patella. Uh, the patella is a sesamoid bone. It's a bone within the quadriceps muscle, and from it leads the ligamentum patelli. Just what it does, nobody really knows. You'll see patients who've had their patella removed, for a severe comminuted fracture, and provided they have good muscle tone, providing they keep their quadriceps active, they will tell you that their knee functions perfectly well. Uh, my own view is that it does protect the anterior aspect of the knee joint. And then away from the knee, not involved in the knee joint itself, we have the upper end of the fibula with its head, Below it, its neck, and at the top of the neck, the styloid process. The neck of the fibula is important because just here, like so, is the only nerve in the lower limb that you can palpate in the living subject. If you put your thumbnail just below the head of the fibula on the neck and press in there, it hurts, the common perineal nerve. Now, if I show you those landmarks on the living subject, so I'll get my colleague to bend his knee like this, the medial and lateral condyle of the femur are easily palpated. The patella leading to the ligamentum patelli the medial and the lateral condyle of the tibia. Between the two, quite easy to define, we can feel the line of the knee joint in there. Now, one important thing is that the head of the fibula is much more posterior than most people think. People feel for the head of the fibula there. It's not there at all. It's there. You can feel it on yourself. There's the head of the fibula. There's the neck of the fibula. And I don't want to hurt my assistant, but if I stick my thumbnail in there, he won't like it at all because that's the line of the common perineal nerve. If I show this to you on the, on the bones, there's the tibia. There on its lateral condyle is a distinct facet there, much more posteriorly than people imagine. There's the head of the fibula, and do you see it articulates much more posteriorly than people imagine. It's right around the back there. One interesting fact, which is of, of some clinical importance, is you'll see, because of the width of the pelvis, from the hip joint downwards, the femur slopes quite markedly medially, like so. And so one wonders how it is that the patella here doesn't slip off the front of the femoral condyles. It does, make, it does, in fact, 
happen from time to time, lateral dislocation of the patella. And there are two interesting mechanisms that stop that from happening. Mechanism number one is the shape of the bones themselves. Let me demonstrate that on these disarticulated specimens. Here's the same femur on the left side. Notice that the lateral condyle of the femur is built up here compared with that medial side. When we look at the back posterior aspect of the patella, there's the front of the patella, posterior aspect. Notice that the lateral facet on the posterior aspect of the patella, again, is quite built up like so. If I put the two together, and I look at it like so, this built up lateral condyle of the femur, this built up facet on the lateral side of the patella, tends to stop the patella dislocating laterally like that. Secondly, if we look at my assistant once again, the medial part of the quadriceps, vastus medialis, sweeps down and inserts right down along the side of the patella on its medial side. The lateral part of quadriceps, vastus lateralis, just goes to the top of the patella like that. So when the when quadriceps contracts and pulls on the patella, these fibers are holding the patella medially and stopping it from dislocating laterally. It's banging against this built up lateral facet and it's being pulled medially by these lowermost fibers of vastus medialis. Now, dislocation of the patella does occur from time to time. Jolly painful it is too. Some patients will have recurrent dislocation of the patella and often when they're investigated, the lateral condyle of the femur is less well developed than it is in most subjects. Now there is an interesting and not uncommon congenital anomaly of the patella called bipartite patella. And the scenario is usually this. You're called down to the accident department or accident emergency uh, to see someone who's injured his knee and the knee has been x-rayed and they say, oh, we've got a poor chap here with a fractured patella. When you look at the x-ray, his patella is not the least bit tender, and the x-ray shows this very typical appearance of a lens-shaped piece of the patella on its upper lateral aspect, uh, which is quite separate from the main patella, separated, in fact, by a sheet of fibrous tissue. The patella itself isn't the least bit tender. There's no bruising or anything else to suggest a fracture. And the trick is to x-ray the other knee, when nearly always, I haven't personally seen an exception to the rule, the congenital deformity is bilateral. He certainly hasn't got bilateral fractures of the patella, bipartite patella. While we're looking at the front of the knee, there are two important subcutaneous bursi. Uh, that are present. Nothing to do with the knee joint itself. They're subcutaneous, they're not connected with the knee. One is situated immediately in front of the patella. If I dissected through skin and superficial fascia in a normal knee, as in this subject, you'd find a little space there, connective tissue with a little film of clear fluid within it, the prepatellar bursa. Similarly, in front of the tibial tuberosity there, which is easy to feel, there is an infrapatellar bursa. They are important because with repeated minimal trauma, 
they can swell up. And you'll see patients with a pre-patella bursa there, with a big cystic swelling in front of the patella, which may become inflamed, pre-patella bursitis. You'll also see other patients with an infrapatella bursa there, which swells up with fluid and may become inflamed, an infrapatella bursitis. Now, a bit of fun. Housemaids, when they scrub the floor in the good old days, would lean forward onto their patella to scrub the floor. So a pre-patella bursitis was given the old nickname of housemaid's knee. If you kneel to pray, you kneel on your tibial tuberosity. If that bursa swells up with fluid and becomes inflamed, we talk about a clergyman's knee, housemaid's knee, clergyman's knee. This slide simply shows a lady with a typical pre-patella bursa, a pre-patella bursitis in front of the patella, housemaid's knee. An infrapatella bursa would be situated just there in front of the tibial tuberosity.